the provinces transformed. Ottoman provincial government, as it had developed between the 14th and mid-16th centuries was a rational system. It divided the empire into provinces, provinces into sanyaks and sanyaks into fiefs, that is, into Haas, Zemits and Timars. The governors general, Sanjak governors and fief holders drew their income directly from the revenue sources which the sultan had assigned to them and, in return, they served the sultan and provincial government, and also, as a cavalry army, the hierarchy of provincial government was equally a military hierarchy. On campaigns, governors general were commanders-in-chief of all the troops in their province, the Sanjak. Governors commanded all the cavalrymen who held Timars and Zemits in their Sanjak. Among the fief holders, too, there was a hierarchy of command, with some of Zemit holders acting as officers in command of contingents of Timar holders. The Timar holders, too, went to war at the head of a retinue of one or more armed retainers. The system was clearly effective in both its functions. For much of the 16th century, a period for which records and some modern studies are available, there seems to have been an increase in the population of the empire and in the size and numbers of settlements, 48 suggesting that this was, by and large, a period of prosperity and stability in the Ottoman provinces. The relative orderliness of provincial government may have played a part in this. More obviously, however, the system fulfilled its military function. Year after year, the Sultan raised a cavalry army from the provinces, which could measure its effectiveness in victories. By the late 16th century, there had been a drastic change. 49. Ottoman armies no longer enjoyed the victories of earlier times. The Austrian War of 1593-1606 brought disasters and ended in stalemate. More humiliatingly, the wars with Iran after 1603 brought defeat and loss of territory. Contemporary observers who commented on this decline from glory found the reason for it largely in the breakdown of provincial government and, since it was the provinces that supplied the bulk of the army, there clearly was a link. In Anatolia in particular, the commentators noticed the impoverishment and flight from the land that accompanied the Jalali rebellions. An anonymous author who presented to Osman II, 1618-22a, treatise on the problems of the empire and how to cure them, remarked, for example, in the province of Shiva's there was such scarcity and famine that it became well known how the peasants ate, not only cats and dogs, but also human flesh. Such conditions, he continues, had led to a drastic fall in revenue. Previously, the treasury of Shiva's had not only covered the expenses of the province, but had also remitted 8 million akshas annually to the imperial treasury. Now, he says, it never remits more than a quarter of a million. The author also noted how viziers and provincial governors no longer possessed retinues of valiant slaves and armories to match, ready to go on campaign the moment the sultan commanded. In contrast to this old order, he describes Ahmed I's farcical campaign against the Jalalis in 1605, which office holders treated as a wedding or a pleasure trip, with many arriving late. What, however, struck observers most forcefully was the collapse of the Timar system, which had both provided a cavalry army and helped to maintain order. In the old days, the anonymous author comments, fiefs in Remelia, Anatolia and the Arab provinces had produced 200 fighting men, and it was with these that the Sultan had conquered lands. Now, he continues, most of these had disappeared. The old system of allocating Timars through governors general had collapsed and, instead of going to fighting men, Timars went to the unqualified or into the baskets of great men. By baskets the author was referring to the practice, which became common in the early 17th century, whereby great men placed their own nominees in Timars, while themselves pocketing the revenues. In a question to the author, the Sultan himself noted how viziers, governors general, and other office holders had bestowed Timars on members of their own household down to the cats and dogs and apos. The result was a loss in the number of Timars that still produced warriors. Instead, the author claims, those who went on campaign were mostly Turks, gypsies, former brigands and people who have purchased Timars and apos. The breakdown in the old system of allocating and recording Timars had also led to disputes over possession. The reform writer, Kochi Bey, in the treatise which he wrote for Murad 4, 1623-40 and 1631-2, comments that, because fiefs were allocated from Istanbul, only one in ten was undisputed. Ain Ali, in his treatise, of 1609, had noticed the same thing, when it is a question of service. On campaigns, he comments pithily, not one man appears from ten. Timars, but at the time of tax gathering, ten men dispute one Timar. An apos. The reform writers located the reason for the decline in the corruption of the body politic. Because, the author of the anonymous treatise writes, the gate of bribery is open, 
the provinces face ruin. Anapos. The process, they claim, began in the reign of Murad III, 1574 95. The reform writers were accurate in their account both of the decline and of the period when it began. By the 17th century, appointment to high office did involve spending money. Furthermore, surviving documents support their view of depopulation in the provinces, at least in Anatolia, and a drop in the number of Timars. In 1573, for example, there were 592 Timars and 51 Zemits in the western Anatolian Sanjak of Aden. In 1632-3, the figures were 261 and 31 respectively, a decline of nearly 40%. Records of appointment also show that, in 1563-4, about 70% of Timars, initially bestowed in the Sanjak of Aden went to the sons of Timar. Holders, in 1588-9, during the time of Murad III, this figure had fallen to 19%, in 1610, to less than 10%.50 this loss of Timar. Holders as a hereditary caste was something that the reform writers lamented as a cause of present catastrophe. However accurate their description of the symptoms of decline in Apos, the reform writers were undoubtedly oversimplifying in their analysis of its causes.51 Although the symptoms of this transformation became acute, as the reform writers noted, during the reign of Murad. 3. There are signs of change from earlier in the century. Kochi Bey and others looked back on the time our holders of Suleiman I's day as a closed and valiant military caste, but this picture seems over-optimistic. In the 1530s, the Sultan certainly took measures to restrict entry to the ranks of Timar holders, but this was probably because the lack of new land for distribution was already apparent rather than a deliberate attempt to form a military caste. Furthermore, Timar holding, at the lowest level, imposed heavy burdens of service in return, for a very modest income, and signs of discontent are already apparent before and during the reign of Suleiman I. In 1511, for example, Timar holders joined Shah Kulu's rebellion. Later in the century, the fact that the rebel prince Bayezid was able in 1558-9 to attract Timar holders to his cause is an indication that these were not happy with their position. The long wars with Iran and Austria imposed further burdens, requiring them, during campaigns which lasted for over a decade, to overwinter in the field.52 during these decades, too, the Timar holders of Anatolia, who did not serve on campaign, faced the task of maintaining the peace in an increasingly rebellious region. A symptom of discontent during this period was, increasingly, refusal to fight and desertion. During the Iranian War of 1578-90, Timar holders frequently sought to avoid service. In this respect, a command of 1583 to the Sanjak governor of Bozok is typical. The preamble to the decree notes that cavalrymen with Timars worth less than 3,000 akshas per year were not to go on campaign, but instead to remain behind, to maintain security in the Sanjak. However, the preamble continues, it has been heard that most of the cavalrymen, great and small, in the province of Rum, have stayed where they are, each one having, acquired, with some excuse, for remaining behind, a noble, command of the Sultan. They remain behind and receive decrees, exempting them from service, on the slightest excuse.53 The discontent among the cavalrymen, which was already plain during the war with Iran, turned, during the Austrian war, to desertion and dismissal, the most notorious instance occurring after the Battle of mezzo Karistes in 1596. The result, Ottoman historians insist, was to turn deserters into brigands. The burdens of service, whether as soldiers on campaign or as militiamen fighting rebels, made time our holding unattractive, at least, for those with low-value fiefs. This became especially true in the late 16th century, a period when inflation diminished income, wars were prolonged, there was little hope of taking booty, and new revenues following the conquest of new territory were no longer available. The resulting discontent among Timar holders, and consequent desertion and rebellion, was undoubtedly a factor in the collapse of the Timar system which 17th century writers observed in their own time. There were, however, other causes, military and administrative. The military development which undermined the time are holding. Cavalry was the increasing use in war of handheld firearms, and with this, the practice of fighting from entrenched positions. This required increasing infantry numbers at the expense of cavalry. Until the late 16th century, horsemen had greatly outnumbered footmen in Ottoman armies. In the mid-16th century, the Janissaries, the Sultan's standing infantry corps, had numbered about 10 to 12 000. Altogether, while there would normally be about 40 000 cavalrymen in a single army. However, during the War of 1593-1606, the Ottoman cavalry proved to be greatly inferior on the battlefield to the Austrian infantry. 
The response of the Ottoman government was therefore to expand its own infantry numbers, which it did by increasing the number of janissaries, and by recruiting infantrymen in the provinces from among the young men who knew how to use firearms. This solution brought with it a major problem. Payment of the janissaries and the infantry levies was through the central treasury, which found itself unable to meet the demand for cash, a problem that the late 16th century inflation exacerbated. One solution was to debase the coinage. In 1585, in order to pay the janissaries and other troops of the imperial household, the government reduced the silver content in the ox by almost 50%. A result of this was a janissary rebellion in 1589, in protest against receiving payment in debased coinage, late payment and a further debasement in 1600 of slightly less than 30%, led to further janissary riots in 1593 and 1606. This solution, therefore, merely caused further problems. Another way was to borrow. In 1591, the government borrowed 70 gold pieces to pay the wages of the janissaries and, after this, there were few years when the treasury did not call on credit to meet its obligations.54. There was, however, another solution, and this was to increase the revenue sources available to the treasury. Until the late 16th century, the government had assigned most taxes in Romelia, Anatolia and Syria to Timar holders, who drew on them directly as a source of income. These taxes did not, therefore, come directly to the treasury. A way to overcome the treasury deficit was therefore to convert Timars and Zemits to tax farms, whose income the farmers transferred directly to Istanbul. It seems probable that the first large scale transfer came in 1597, following the confiscation of the Timars, belonging to the deserters of Mesocharistes. Thereafter, the number of tax farms increased at the expense of Timars, a development which mirrored the changes in the composition of the army. Fewer cavalrymen needed fewer Timars to support them, while the growing number of infantrymen required more tax farms as a source of cash for their wages. This was an important factor in the collapse of the Timar system that so disturbed the reform writers of the 17th century. Another factor was a gradual change in the way of allocating Timars. The decrees of the 1530s had formalized entitlement to fiefs, and, at the same time, there was a regular procedure for allocation. Timar holding became, by and large, hereditary within the military class, and allocation was by recommendation to the governors general, and subject to ratification by the sultan. In the late 16th century, exceptions to this pattern became common. During the long wars of 1579-1990 and 1593-1606, it became usual for army commanders in the field to allocate timars to replace cavalrymen who had died in battle or who were absent at the roll call, giving them sometimes to men who put themselves forward without a recommendation from a patron. In the 17th century, Kochi Bay was to point particularly to this category of timar holder as a cause of decline. In 1584, he wrote, Ozdemirulu Osman Pasha, the commander in the Iranian campaign, began to give Timar's worth 3,000 akshas to outsiders, but only to men who had performed outstanding service. Thereafter, however, fiefs went, regardless of merit, to city lads and peasants, who had no entitlement by birth. More important, however, in transforming the Timar system was the increasing influence of the palace. In the early 16th century, it was unusual for the palace, without a memorandum from a governor general, to issue a decree allocating a timar. In fact, allocations of this kind were sufficiently rare to merit an explanatory note in the register. Later in the century, these notes disappear, suggesting that the palace was beginning to exercise more control. By 1586, with the issue of a decree depriving governors general of the right to allocate zemits, that is fiefs worth more than 20 auctions per year, this tendency became explicit. With these developments, the old system effectively collapsed. These changes in the method of allocation brought with them new types of timar holder. What becomes particularly noticeable is the large number of timars that supported slaves or retainers of viziers, governors general and other office holders, the registers noting such. Men as the follower of X, the man of Y or attached to Z and Apos. Such timars had always existed and, indeed, sometime after 1541, Lutfi Pasha stated that grand viziers maintained their men with timars. In the late 16th century, However, the practice became more widespread and, in the 17th, became standard. A note in an early 17th century register states as a rule, it is customary that timars of registered servants of a vizier, in case of the death of the timar holder, be, again given to his servant. An apos. It was not, however, only the retainers of viziers and governors, who received timars in this way. By the late 16th century, men, 
from the households of other members of the Imperial Council, such, as the Chancellor or Chief Treasurer, or the followers of palace officers, such as the head pantryman or head gardener, could also receive, their pay in the form of timars. It was common, too, for even minor, office holders, such as clerks in the chancellery or members of the six, divisions to obtain timars for their servants. Princesses similarly, acquired fiefs for their retinue, who clearly had no obligation to serve. In the army, it became, in fact, customary to append lists of exempted timar holders to the muster rolls of cavalrymen, and dismissal for, non-appearance on campaign was valid only if the missing man's, name did not appear in the list of exemptees. Even then, if a person, lost his timar because he had failed to appear at the roll call of the, army, he could keep it if he could prove that he was a retainer of a, great man.55. By the early 17th century, therefore, timar holding had, changed its character, fewer fiefs supported cavalrymen, and more, supported office holders and their followers. Some went to nominees, whose sponsors pocketed the income, a practice which Murad IV, formally abolished when, in 1631, he confiscated such timars and reallocated them to fighting men. Murad's reforms did not, however, last. Records indicate that the changes in the timar system were permanent. From the late 16th century, the practice of drawing up, detailed registers of timars in each district ceased. Instead, the land, Registry Office began to compile registers of households grouped, into taxable units, together with other sources of government revenue. To maintain a record of timars, the government did, from the, mid-17th century, begin to keep summary lists, but the old, system of detailed registers never revived. These new administrative, procedures indicate that, by this time, timars were neither the major, support for the army, nor the most important means of distributing, revenue. Accompanying the decline in timar holding was a change in the system of provincial government. Until the late 16th century, the hierarchy of timar holder, zemit holder, sinjak governor and governor general had also been one of military command. At the centuries, end, this too began to alter. With the chronic shortfall in treasury, income, it became possible for tax farmers to acquire governorships, either for themselves or their nominees, on condition of increasing the revenues of the province or sinjak. For the same reason, it was no longer uncommon, as it had been, for a treasurer to receive the office, of governor-general. With this development, provincial government, began to lose its military character.56. There were other changes, too, in the mode of appointment to, provincial government. Until the last decades of the 16th century, it was normal to appoint Sanjak governors from the lower ranks, of the provincial administration, so that, typically, a career might, lead from a post in the palace to a position in the registry or treasury of a province, and from there to a Sanjak governorship. In the 1560s, about two-thirds of Sanjak governors had received their posts by this route. It was normal, too, that a governor-general should have previously served as a Sanjak governor. In 1570, about four-fifths of governors-general had come to their posts by this route. In 1580, however, this pattern began to change, with appointees from the palace and, increasingly, from other great households, beginning to outnumber men with previous experience of provincial government. By 1630, only about a quarter of Sanjak governors and governors general had come to their position from an earlier provincial posting. At the same time, another change served to undermine the integrity of the old system of provinces and Sanyaks. From the 1580s, few Sanjak governors served in a particular post. For more than three years, by the 1630s, over half served less than a year, and about 90% less than two. The same was true of governors general. By the 1630s, over half served less than a year. This, was a result, presumably of increasing competition for office, which, had the effect not merely of shortening periods of service, but also of, increasing the time spent out of office. Loss of position brought with, it a loss of income and so, to compensate for this, it became common, for the sultan to make lifetime grants of revenue, which served to, maintain dismissed governors in the periods between appointments. Such grants had been less common in the earlier period, and had the, effect of undermining the old system of provinces and sanyaks. Traditionally governors held their haas, the fief which produced their income, within their area of jurisdiction, whether this was a sanjak or a province. Life grants, however, meant that the lands or other revenue sources that formed a governor's permanent income lay outside his own area of government, producing a fragmentation of the old provincial system, at the expense particularly of the sanyaks. In the 1630s, too, some sanyaks, such as Babert in the province of Erzurum, or Smedrovo in the province of Buda were abolished and assigned, as revenue to the governor-general.57. By the mid-17th century, therefore, Ottoman provincial, 
government was very different from what it had been a century earlier. Most noticeable was the fall in the number of timars, and the assignment of timars as tax farms, or to non-military nominees of the palace or other great households. The changing nature of timars had its counterpart in the changing nature of provincial government. Until the end of the 16th century, provincial governors had also been military commanders. With the decline in the number of timars, and the appointment of some governors with fiscal rather than military responsibilities, this ceased to be the case, except perhaps in border areas. This was a development which undermined Sanjak, governors in particular, whose main function had been to oversee the timar holders in their sanyaks and to command them on the battlefield. The increasing allocation of lifetime revenues from their district to men from outside the Sanjak also tended to fragment their area of command, and to emphasize their loss of authority.